Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Dr. Olgan Chichik, an international higher education leader and senior expert on quality insurance and accreditation. Olgan has had a varied and interesting career across the European higher education area, including the UK, Dubai, Cyprus, Turkey, Singapore, Switzerland, quite a few places. Skilled in the internationalization of higher education, he specializes in strategic planning and developing quality assurance and accreditation. Olgan's a board member of CHIA's International Quality Group, and he joins us today to talk about how U.S. institutions can grow their enrollment through establishing overseas branch campuses in the Middle East and other areas. Olgan, welcome to the show. Hi, Dram. Thank you very much for having me. Great to see you. Thank you. And you too. It's been a while since we've had a chance to talk. I'm looking forward to our conversation about how we build international enrollment through opening branch campuses, something you've got a lot of experience in. Thank you. Yeah. I'm also looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, I'll be happy to share my experience. And this is really like a hot topic post-pandemic era. So let's have some discussion on that. Thank you. Good topic. I look forward to it. So to kick us off, give us a little bit about your background, who you are, what you do over there in uh, in Turkey. Thank you, Dram. Yeah, I think I call myself as an international expert because I'm all around the globe with some associations, affiliations. But yes, currently I'm based in Izmir in Turkey. It has been almost a year that I'm, I'm back at home after 21 years being abroad. Uh, what I do, basically, I'm a professor of business and management, but last 15 years I have been working on quality assurance and accreditation. Currently, I am in the International Advisory Council of Cheyang. I am a full board member of INCOAHE. I am the vice president of the Sienka in Europe. Also, I'm a member of British Accreditation Council uh, Accreditation Committee. I do provide advisory services. I'm an advisor to a few quality assurance agencies like in Azerbaijan, in Kazakhstan, as well as in Turkey. Many board memberships and international expert on quality assurance agencies, reviewer, and so forth. So in a nutshell, this is me. <laughs> well, you've done, <laughs> you've done a lot. You're doing a lot. In Thank the... you in the uh, areas of accreditation, assessment, and in international universities. In the U.S., we've been having a challenge, although it's getting better. It was brought yeah. on a lot by the pandemic, as well as some of the policies of the previous administration, with a decreasing enrollment of the international students. You know, there's sure. a lot of challenges going on that one of the solutions has been, and this is what we're going to talk about today, having universities from the U.S. establish overseas branch campuses. I think that's really a good strategy, Dram. I would, I would really uh, recommend as well to universities where I also work as an international consultant. This is, I think, really a good practice from U.S. universities as well as U.K. universities or Canada or Australia. Actually, there are some education hubs coming up in some parts of the world, namely in the Gulf, for example. I lived eight years in Dubai. At that time, it was the beginning of these branch campuses, satellite campuses, you name it. And now this is getting much more crucial uh, with the post-pandemic challenges. Agree on that, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, you know, for a student to come over to the U.S., you know, forget all of the challenges that we're having right now with, with guns and, you know, shootings, et cetera, and the U.S. getting a reputation that it's not particularly safe for people to come. It's also very expensive for them to come here. And then there's the, always the visa issues as well. Yeah, I think these are some really big, big obstacles for international students 
it's not only the pandemic time, but also lost this, say, five to 10 years issue. So this is one side of the coin. And the other side is the tough competition globally. Because, as I said, the Middle East, the Gulf area, or in, in, in Europe, as well as in the Far East and Asia, there are lots of higher education institutions and hubs are competing with the traditional uh, U.S. and U.K. or Canada universities. Therefore, this is a big, big moment towards the student recruitment to find some other options. If not, they would like to see those countries that they cannot go, like you said in the U.S. case, to have them at home. So this brings a new dimension that universities open branch campuses and satellite campuses in different parts of the world where they can provide their services much better and, and quicker and easier and with a minimum cost and effort for those at the local level. Yeah. And and that is a huge issue is having that campus at the local le level. It really, one, it expands the U.S. footprint for the institution, but I think more importantly in terms of you know, whether it be in Dubai, whether it be in Turkey or, you know, another country, it certainly helps the local folks there be able to get a very quality education from a U.S. or another institution. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that's the point, because the, the thing is that once the university has a reputation at home, when they have a branch campus abroad, they have to provide the same quality services and their reputation should continue over there. So this is really like a threshold and a must. What I experienced from, uh, when I was in Dubai, the well-known universities from US or UK or Canada, yes, they do provide their own experience and their own structure, their own rules and regulations, quality issues, issues, as well as accreditation is really important. Now, what we started doing as an accreditors, it's not only the home universities accredited, but also the satellite campuses needs to be accredited as well within its own context. So they have gone through this process as well. So it really became like an identical, what they have at home, they provide here in the branch campuses as well. This is a good assurance, this is a good prestige, and it's an attractive for the local students to go rather than going all the way to the home countries. So it's, that's something really important. In order to assure this, it's not only the name and the system structure curriculum, but also the structure of faculty members, their qualifications, and their own credentials are really important. Likewise, the resources that they provide. These, these are like a must for a university to have a branch campus to be successful and reputable as at their home country. It's very similar, I would think, to opening a branch campus in a different city in the U.S. You'd have to get that accredited as well, but then you have the international flavor of it and you have to be able to meet the localized expectations of that campus and that country. There's a lot of folks doing it over there. I mean, when we spoke a couple of days ago, you had mentioned Michigan State yeah. and, you know, putting their campus in Dubai. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, Michigan State opened the campus when I was there and many other universities from UK or like Wollongong from Australia or Canada as well. That's really important to have the big names there because it's like a benchmark. So once you put the bar high and the others really try to get that level as well. So the accreditation at home or in a different city within the same country is something, but having an international accreditation in another country doing an operation over there within the local context, because you have to get an also approval from the local authorities as well to the legal aspects of or formal aspects of it. But as you said, the most important thing is also the cultural aspects of it. So you have to really obey the cultural sensitivities and follow the rules and, and the expectations of the people, the sensitivities of the ground, whether it's in the classroom or it's in on the practice. This is very much important. 
what they do usually in orientation to their faculty members as well as the admin staff who are international to know the local contacts, local culture, local sensitivities, and respect to that. And it, it might be a religious sensitivities in case uh, of Dubai, for example. We experience lots of things from the international community. So I, I remember having a class of, let's say, 20 with uh, 15 nationalities and 15 different cultures. So this is really a challenge. So as a faculty member, you have to really be careful in every word that you, you spend on the class because it might really offend someone or it might be a route to, to another and so forth. Uh, it's not only the uh, words, but also the gestures, the body language, and everything really makes a, a, a difference. So this is the challenges of French campuses from the cultural perspective that they have to really adapt themselves and respect to the reality of the ground. Yeah. So we're going to get into all of those things here in just a moment. But in the planning phase for if you're thinking about doing something like this, if you're a large U.S. university and you want to open a branch campus, let's just say in Izmir. Okay. What are some of the considerations that you'd be thinking about in choosing your location? I think. This is really important. The location really makes a difference. The, the right city, for example, uh, first of all, is really important. And then within the city, the, the location that the accessibility is an important issue that people can easily access there, especially the student community, let's say. Or if it's going to be a real campus, an isolated campus, then you have to have all, all the resources there. And the cost issue might be another factor that you have to consider. I believe the connection with the industry, with the local community, is another factor that you might consider. Because at the universities, we are not really trying to just give training, uh, education and training or, or teaching and learning to the students, but also it is a service to the society. It is a research and development as well, or industry connection, innovation, and, and the internships that they're going to follow up, or the invited speakers from the industry, from the professional bodies. So it has to be really a location where you can have an easy access and you can get all these components together easily so that people can interact, can do some events together, can have uh, research together, can work in, in the industry together, and so forth. So the cost issue, the, uh, the accessibility issue, and maybe the multicultural community and connection would be important factors, I believe. I think you're absolutely right. Those, all of those factors are important in choosing your location. So once you've chosen your location, what are the key things that need to consider? I mean, we've talked about the culture already, but we, there's more that we'll need to get into, especially, you know, in hiring faculty, things along those lines. So let's start off with language. What are some of the considerations that you need to think about with language? Yeah, I think it's really a tricky point. If the community is an English-speaking community, like in Dubai or in Hong Kong or Singapore, that might be really easy to, to adjust. But if the local people, the local community, or the local students are not really uh, competent in, in a foreign language, especially I'm, I'm referring to English, then this is really a challenge because otherwise it's going to be only on-campus activities that they can speak. I had an example from a student uh, studying in a city. I'm not going to name it, but the student told me that Oh, sir, everything is perfect, but uh, when we are within the campus, when we are out of campus, we are like a fish out of sea because nobody speaks English. We cannot find our way. We cannot really uh, cope with the day-to-day -day activities, which is really a pity for an international student, isn't it? So, therefore, you have to create such an environment where student, international students can feel comfortable. It's not that only the students speak English, but also those who are really interacting should be capable as well. Therefore, language is really like an important factor to be considered when having a branch campus, at least in the surrounding area, people should be able to speak that language so that they can communicate. It's As I said, it's not only really teaching and learning or just getting a degree, but it's also experiencing the local culture or even the multicultural environment that you are in. So you have to really 
interact and exchange with others as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and typically it's going to be the your population where you locate is going to be far more diverse than what you have in the U.S. Absolutely. Is instruction going to be in the native language? Is it going to be in English? These are all questions. You know, faculty. Yeah. How do you hire faculty? The U.S. professors, if they come over, unless they're multilingual, yeah, they're going to have challenges. And then, of course, students want to know they're getting the same quality education that they would in the U.S., but they may identify more easily with professors of that speak their own language, of their own heritage, etc. Yeah, I think that's also vice versa. You're right, really. It's not only the teaching language, but also the local language really is important that people could also speak that language. So what, what they do usually, they even in Turkey here, they provide the Turkish language courses for international students as well as international faculty members so that they can really get interact and uh, understand the local culture and context much better. So if it's in, let's say, Saudi, you have to provide them Arabic courses. If it's in, in China or, or somewhere else, the local language has to be there. The, from the faculty perspective, faculty members' perspective, yes, you might be really a, a perfect professor in your field with your own language, but when you are in an international environment in a different country with a different culture, you have to really have a broadened view and perspective so that you understand people's challenges, whether it's language-wise, whether it is cultural-wise, whether it is the knowledge-wise. So this connection becomes a little bit tough. Sometimes the students are shy, sometimes they are arrogant. Some, I mean, you, you name it. So you have to really understand the context and adjust yourself with that respect. So language is an important factor. I know that even if you say a few words in their local uh, language, they're really happy and they really connect much better, so they respect you. So it's better to put some efforts and some, maybe before they, they are uh, there, give some extra courses or certificates to have some basic, at, at least for the local language, or after they arrive to the destination, they could really try to get some uh, extra efforts, know and understand and speak the language. That will connect them much better, not only with the students, but also with the other faculty members locally recruited, as well as third parties that they are communicating with, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and it's so important to understand the culture. You know, it's not only the language, but it's the nonverbal language. It's how you conduct yourself. I know whenever I have an overseas project, I buy a guide to that particular country. Cool. And I read through that to understand. I mean, in, in Arabic countries, you don't offer your left hand. It's not considered to be, you know, it, it's culturally inappropriate. It, it's true. And, you know, there's other things like that. Showing a picture of the Prophet Muhammad is not done yeah. either. And so there's all, all of these nuances that someone coming over there needs to understand. I think this is really maybe most critical point, Ram, whether it's a faculty member or an admin staff communicating with students, they have to be very, very well trained in terms of cultural sensitivities. Again, from my experience in abroad in different countries, you have to really know what are the differences in the spoken language, in the nonverbal language, in the gestures, as I said, and the examples that you give, uh, everything really makes, makes a, a difference. And sometimes it's risky. As I said, in a class, if you have five, ten different religious or nationalities or cultural sensitivities, one example that you made would offend another one. Or if you really give a specific examples on something that might be taken as, as a real offense by the other one. So therefore, everything that you, you really share has to be screened and carefully chosen. That's, it's not exaggeration. It's an example that we really experienced. Let me be specific. We had in, in Dubai again, in a multicultural classroom, we had a professor who was really excellent in his field from X country. We thought, oh, it's, it's really a privilege for us to have him. But unfortunately, we could have him only for a semester because 
he could not really adjust himself culturally within the classroom context, and he could not be able to communicate with the students within their cultural expectations. So he offended a few times in the class when he was talking to uh, students. For example, if you are talking to a girl student in a class, you have to have some really sensitivities in your jokes, in whatever you are talking about, the religious sensitivities. Or if it's, an, let's say, an Indian boy, that you have to really treat him in a different way. So the, the, the points that you touch might really affect someone in the class. So you, that's really uh, the big challenge. Therefore, those faculty members has to be trained and aware of these sensitivities and informed and maybe had some orientation to know what would be the consequences. Really, we had some cases that we had to, unfortunately, in the middle of the semester, we had to fire the faculty member because of these unnecessary, uh, silly, but very important for them sensitivities. Mm -hmm. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I've done four projects with Arab universities. And when I schedule calls, I actually give them an option of what times they want. They typically work later in the day and in the evenings than, than we do here in the U.S. Yeah. But I'm also very careful to look up when the call to prayer is. You know, there's yeah. five, five different calls to prayer, and I don't propose a time where that's going to be on a particular day. I make sure it's an hour before or at least a half an Absolutely. hour after. So it's just understanding that culture that you're having to work with. Yeah. I think this is the same when you have a, let's say, business lunch or a business dinner with different cultures, what they eat, what they don't eat, what they drink, what they don't drink. So it's really sometimes you might think that you're doing a gesture, bringing them X as a gift, but it might be an offense for them. For example, now it's the Ramadan time in the Islamic world. So when you have a dinner, uh, we had an example last week. We, we had a guest from Europe. And I took him to a dinner. The time was 7.30 to break the fast. And we had to wait until that. He, he was very much really amazed. He said, oh, this is really interesting. Everyone is sitting and waiting, but nobody eats, you know, until the prayer time. So this is a good experience. So he was kind to, to do the same. But he could have started having his food or he could ask for, a, let's say, a, a drink. That would be a little bit weird to the people around. So therefore, these kind of sensitivities are really important. The cultural exchange, cultural understanding, and compromises are really needed wherever you are. I use this example in my classes. Whenever you are in Rome, do what Romans do. So that will save you. Otherwise, it's really risky, isn't it? It, it is. And, you know, the same goes for curriculum design. You, yeah. you Certain cultures in, in you know, certain countries in the Arabic culture That's do right. not drink wine. They don't yeah. drink alcohol at all. Yeah. And sometimes I wish the U.S. was a little more like this. But, you know, uh, you obviously, you know, for example, in Saudi Arabia, you would not do a class on wine. Yeah, wine testing, yeah, maybe, yeah, it's yeah. risky and, and it's not really preferred or, or possible or, pre yeah, it's it's not there maybe in the curriculum. So that's that's true, yeah, absolutely. In yeah. a culinary art class, for example, of course, yeah, you have to be careful about that. I totally understand and agree with you yeah. on that. So the courses that you choose, it's not only the maybe alcohol, but also the gender sensitivities or other religious issues that, as I said, the examples that given in the textbooks or in the syllabus or in, in your notes or, or speech and recorded videos and so forth. Even in the online uh, teaching and learning uh, period during the pandemic, I experienced in some countries that they don't really switch on their cameras. And I was asking the lecturer during our interview in the reviews, I said, are you happy with that? He or she says, no, but we cannot do much. Uh, I say, why? Because they say that students, especially uh, in some specific countries, the girls, they don't really prefer to be visible and they turn off their cameras and they just in a listen mode. But if it's something that you have to interact and you have to maybe do a group discussions and so forth, then it might be a challenge for a faculty member. So you have to find another way of getting out of this loop. 
So these are really the challenges in terms of satellite campuses, in terms of international delivery, in terms of intercultural teaching environment, isn't it? It, it really is. And of course, there's you've got to look at the cost benefit piece yeah. of this. There's obvious, you know, is there going to be a benefit to the area? Is it going to provide more employment opportunities for the local population? These type of things. Absolutely. I think, yeah, we, we are just talking from the technical or academic perspective. But when you when you look at the concept strategically, of course, this model works perfectly all around the globe. I mean, I would say Dubai is one example, Qatar is another one, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Singapore, name it. So all around uh, Malta, all around the globe, you would find some education hubs where these satellite campuses are very much effective, working perfectly, and there's a high demand towards these kind of providers. Why is this? Because the local community, the local students, for some reasons that we already discussed, prefer to go to these institutions in the first place because they will get lots of advantages afterwards. It's not only the time, it's not only the cost, but also the employment opportunity because those are well-known, accredited international universities. When they graduate from there, obviously, they will get a better position, some better jobs and better future perspective. So this is why I think they are on high demand and preferred by the local people. I, I think you're right. Now, I've got a question for you, which has kind of been nagging at me. Instead of opening a branch campus, what is the receptivity for online education? For instance, say the University of Massachusetts, which just acquired Brandman University so that it's, it's University of Massachusetts Global. The online education in countries, is that as well received as a branch campus? Not really. I would say in this part of the world, online education has a different image and perspective and, and uh, acceptance level. Uh, I know in the U.S., I was there, for example, during the pandemic and uh, at USF. And when I talked to my colleague, I said, oh, now we're going to do online. So I was going to be, he said, I don't care because I have been teaching online for 10 years or 15 years. So they have already been doing that. I think even in the online delivery, there is a cultural factor involved. So in this part of the world, online education is not very much popular or in demand or, or accepted or seen as a same quality than the traditional one. So the acceptance level is not same. The quality assurance is, is not really there as far as online delivery is concerned in this part of the world. Uh, therefore, it's not well respected. So those who are graduate from online programs don't get the same opportunities compared to others. That might be a reason why I would say no to this question, Trump, because it really makes a difference at the local context here. And I'm, I'm referring to, the let's say, Middle East or... Uh, in, in Turkey or in, in this region, uh -huh. uh, not in like uh, in, in U.S. To be honest, in some countries, even it's not officially recognized or, or allowed to deliver fully online courses. It could be a certificate, but not a degree. Yeah. So that may be an opportunity for U.S. universities to offer certificates, but in, yes, don't expect your online education offerings to be received in the same light as opening a branch campus no, or bringing international students to the U.S. Absolutely. Because once the students graduate from an online program, they don't get the same privilege that the regular ones get uh, in terms of job opportunities, especially in the government, in terms of promotion, and you name it. Uh, in terms of payments. So therefore, the online delivery is more in the certificates. I would say, for example, micro-credentials is a good opportunity for them to go for. That could work perfectly for the local context in any specific area that they might be strong. However, not a full degree, uh, whether bachelor or master's. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of, a lot of universities over here are going to 
what's called stackable certificates. You'd have multiple certificates which make into a degree, yeah. but the certificates would be accepted, but the degree probably yeah. not. That's that's the problem because we are here in the European context. We have the European Qualifications Framework, and most of the countries in the European higher education area do have this first cycle, second cycle, third cycle, so bachelor, master's, and PhD. They have the certain frameworks and certain learning outcomes, certain credit numbers, and so forth. So unless you don't have this, you don't get an official recognition uh, with your achievements. That's why it may not work directly at the local context. This makes so so much sense, yeah. Olga, and I really appreciate your taking the time to do this. As As we wrap up, what are three takeaways you you pass to uh, university presidents and boards who are thinking about opening branch campuses overseas? Okay, that's that's really a good question. So I didn't realize that time really passed so uh, fast. So we are <laughs> at the end, but that was really wonderful this, talking to you all, as always, Ram. Now the first thing is this is really one of the best opportunity to go for international having a branch campus. I mean. It's good for their student recruitment. It's good for their reputation and, and prestige. It's like an inter international gateway. So go for it. I would really say that. This could increase the student recruitment. But when doing this, we have to be really cautious and very careful about the reality of the ground and cultural sensitivities. And we have to always remember that we are living in a multicultural community, and we have to provide this to them as well. Okay. So great opportunity. Be aware of culture sensitivities, et cetera. What else? Yeah. And uh, it will increase your student recruitment. Okay. It's a good source of income. So <laughs> it, it certainly can be. Yeah. yeah. And you've also got to get it, you know, the campus accredited, et cetera. But it also offers the opportunity to be you know, accredited not only from the U.S. accreditation bodies, but also from other accreditation bodies in the country in which you're operating. Exactly. It's like a double accreditation, so it will give you more uh, power and, and recognition in, in that part of the world as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thanks for, for that, yeah. Well, once in a while, I come up with a good one. <laughs> <laughs> no, always. <laughs> so, so, Olgan, what's next for you? Oh, that's a good question. Now, as I said, I'm going all international here and there. I think, yeah, I want to be more engaged with ANQUA, uh, European uh, Network for Quality Assurance. I need an affiliation with them that's missing. I would like to see myself in the Higher Education Council, working on a strategic level for higher education globally. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun doing all those things. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Drew. So, Olgan, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a real pleasure to to reconnect with you and I look forward to our next conversation. Likewise. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening this week. And a special thank you to Dr. Olgan Chichik and for his sharing with us how U.S. institutions can build international enrollment through establishing overseas campuses. Tune in next week for my conversation with Matt Frank from Blackthorn. Matt is an expert in the burgeoning area of micro-credentials as an alternative or supplement to a degree. And he joins us to talk about how micro-credentials are taking the world by storm and what presidents need to be aware of when venturing into this wild, wild world. Until next week. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show, and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White. <laughs>